Okay, so we're currently being recorded. For those of you who are interested, all of these recordings are available on the forestconnect.info website. If you click on web conferences, you can go to the saved web conferences and, and view them as a flash file. So I'd also like to just jump right in. We always start with a couple of polls just to see um, just to see who you are and what you're doing and, and how you're involved in this. And we'll just we take uh, you know just like 30 or 40 seconds for each of these. So please click in quickly and then we'll we'll jump uh, jump on to the next ones. We don't want to take too much time with us. We don't want to take time away from uh, from Paul and, and from your opportunity to interact with Paul. Okay, we have uh, 45, 46 of 68 people responding, so hopefully we can get a few more folks to click in here. And while you're doing that, uh, I, I don't want to stifle your when I was talking about clearing the chat pod and recording this, please by all means ask questions. That is the only way that we have to communicate with uh, the speaker. So if, if you don't type in the chat pod, we don't know what your questions are. Okay, let's uh, give about five more seconds here on this preliminary poll. You can please sign in. We have 56 of 68 participants going once. Going twice, closing that one. We have uh, one or two more quick ones. Next, I'd like to know what your experience is with these kinds of uh, with forestry extension education. Uh, select one of the first two and one of the last five. So it is either your first web forestry webcast or it isn't, and then how frequently you've participated in real person kinds of workshops and seminars. And those would be forestry based workshops and seminars. What we're trying to do with this is see uh, what kind of a new uh, new um, subscription we get each month and then also trying to understand to what extent this is a unique tool to reach uh, people interested in forestry education. I ran the numbers from 2007 and uh, we had a steady increase in subscription. The, uh, the, 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 we peaked out at 67 was our high for 2007. That happened both in October and in December, and that was the cumulative total for the noon and for the evening session. So Paul Catanzaro has just set a new record. All right, so we have, uh, looks like the voting has slowed down. Last call here. Close that. And I think I have one more before I do the official introduction of Paul. Okay, here's an easy one. Number of acres that you own or manage annually. And then we'll get on with the presentation. If you're, uh, while you're voting here, if you're a forester who's seeking continuing education credits and you didn't sign in with CF after your name, please send me an email and let me know that you want me to record you as a participant. That way I can notify SAF, validate you participated, so then when you go to their website and sign in, they'll be able to confirm that. Okay, we're going to close the voting here. Okay, and now what I'd like to do is uh, introduce Paul Catanzaro. It's a real pleasure to have Paul joining us today. Um, Paul is my counterpart in Massachusetts. He's a forestry specialist and uh, has been working with uh, Anthony D'Amato, who's now at the University of Minnesota, looking at strategies to restore old growth characteristics. And this is uh, a, a, a very interesting topic for a lot of people, and um, as evidenced by the subscription that we have. So with this, I'll turn it over to Paul, and you'll see his uh, microphone bar 
uh, rolling just as you see mine now. He's logged in under the name Forest Connect. So that's the guest speaker connection that he has. And with this, I'll turn it over to Paul and and I'll be sitting here in the wings and watching and enjoying. So Paul, welcome and, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pete. And thank you all for logging on today to learn more about old growth restoration. Uh, it was funny, as everyone was logging on, I was looking down the list, and as phenomenal as the technology is, I, I, I couldn't help but to feel a little disappointed that uh, we couldn't interact more. There's, uh, even in the handful of people I know, there's some uh, great collective knowledge and, and experience on the topic that would be great to share information and experience back and forth. Uh, but for today, it'll have to suffice that we're, um, we type questions in and so forth. But thank you all for coming. Uh, as Pete mentioned, I've been working with a fellow by the name of Tony D'Amato. Um, much of uh, the research I'll talk about today in the uh, upcoming slides, uh, Tony um, was responsible for. Tony was a, a PhD student here at UMass Amherst um, and took a look at uh, Massachusetts old growth and the difference between old growth and second growth forests and um, was quickly then scooped up by the University of Minnesota where he's now the silviculturist. So, he was unable to join with us today, otherwise he too would have been here, another benefit of this technology. Um, so old growth, our forests today are much different than the ones that would have been here pre-settlement. Much of the attention uh, on old growth has been given to protecting true old growth stands, and, and I, I wouldn't at all diminish the importance of that, it's hugely important. But um, it is quite evident that we haven't really put any energy or effort or, or not much uh, into, direct, uh, into developing more old growth characteristics in our landscapes and our forests. And that's what we're here today to talk about. There are a lot of different definitions and related definitions regarding old growth, whether it be climax or primary forest, ancient forest. And, and I, I don't want to get bogged down in semantics. And, and for simplicity's sake, um, I would like to just stick with these two definitions. Old growth are, are forests that have never been directly impacted by human land use, whether it be logging, agriculture, development, or what have you. Uh, as we'll talk about throughout here, these are different forests. They're structurally complex, diversity of tree sizes and age, got a lot of dead wood in them. Second growth forests are ones that established and grew following that human land use. So, so forests that grew after logging and agriculture um, and as I said, there are differences. The, the second growth forest are, are much of what we, we see and know today. The next several slides are, are going to include numbers for Massachusetts for obvious reasons. Um, but the trends themselves uh, remain pretty similar throughout the Northeast. And, and I'm assuming most folks uh, are coming from the Northeast. Old growth forests covered, uh, we estimate, from between 70 to 90 percent of the landscape prior to European settlement. So this really was the dominant forest cover in Massachusetts in the Northeast. You can see uh, on the slide on the left the amount of forest cover, 1650, being reduced uh, in the 1850s, 1875 at the peak of agriculture, and then of course forest cover growing again uh, as people abandoned farms. And most of this, or all of this, most of this would have been old growth forest. It is, it is the condition that our species evolved in and that our systems grew. So where are we at today in Massachusetts? We've got approximately 1,119 acres of old growth forest in Massachusetts. Most of it's contained in the western part of the state out in the Berkshire Hills and the Taconic Mountains. Um, that's about 0.1%. Actually, it's a little less than that of the forested land base in Massachusetts. So again, that's down from 70 to 90% of the historic levels. You know, we're now down to less than 1%. What we're here to talk about today is maybe some options or some thoughts on how to close the gap. Of course, we're, we're assuming we should close the gap and, and something we can discuss. But you know, I put down a couple thoughts here as to, as to why it may be important to close that gap. As I've mentioned a couple times, old growth forest is the, is the dominant land cover uh, for thousands of years uh, northeast, how our species would have evolved. Um, unlike the Pacific Northwest, uh, we really don't have a charismatic species dependent on old growth forest like they may have the spotted owl, for instance. 
but you know there are certain species of fungi and lichens that need old growth or old growth structure. A good example of that is in the upper left-hand corner, the Lobaria, um, as a good example for the Northeast. These areas also uh, serve as important what we call source populations. Uh, source population is a, is a population um, that can provide other individuals to areas that may be down. Um, so uh, wood thrush, black uh, burning warblers, good examples of uh, migratory bird species that uh, do well in these sorts of environments and can act uh, and create, maintain healthy populations that can then disperse out to other areas. So as we take a look at changes in our landscapes, these areas can serve as important source populations um, if in other areas the populations are, are declining for whatever reason. There is a old growth structure can be important, uh, be resilient to large scale disturbance. We're all looking at some, some um, startling global climate change and um, maintaining or restoring the structure and function of our forests will likely make them more resilient as we move forward um, in things such as global climate change. The last bullet there might be a little warm and fuzzy, but but I think it can't be overlooked. Um, you know, it's estimated that, that we, we've documented about 10% of the species on Earth, and we can't help but wonder what, of course, that other 90% is. And uh, it seems to make a lot of sense to, to try to um, restore our systems to a point where we're even uh, protecting and maintaining the biodiversity that we have not even documented yet. Those are some, some benefits, but, but certainly revolve mostly around the ecological. There's a couple of bullets I wanted to throw in here about some other benefits that, that I've seen um, working on this project. You know, in general, I would say we as foresters have done a, a pretty poor job of making forestry uh, applicable uh, or attractive to, to large segments of the forest landowner. Um, the forest landowners in, in the United States in general. Um, you know, I think this type of management uh, may not apply to everybody, may not um, attract everybody, but I think that it will help engage a different or, or maybe even a larger segment of the population of landowners that aren't necessarily interested in traditional forest management and management plans, uh, timber management, etc. And some of you logged on today may very well be those sorts of folks. Um, it also, I think, encourages landscape level thinking. Um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, later on in the slides about um, the parcelization of, of landscapes in mostly private, non-industrial landscapes and how important it is for us to look beyond our own property lines uh, to, to really affect change. And I think this type of subject helps landowners and I think professionals alike you know, start considering um, the greater impacts of landscape level uh, management. It's been a great opportunity, at least for me, to work with closer with conservation organizations that may not be um, as closely aligned with some of the timber management goals, although that's not always true, um, but many are, are more closely aligned with some of the restoration and the biodiversity and so forth that their organizations uh, try to achieve. And uh, I think this is another opportunity and a very good opportunity for forestry and conservation organizations to work together um, a little closer. The last bullet is something that's happened uh, since we um, came out with our little publication about uh, four to five months ago. I've received uh, a handful uh, to a dozen probably of phone calls and emails uh, about from towns, uh, communities, and, and conservation organizations that have wanted to engage or try active management but uh, politically uh, or philosophically, they just weren't sure if it was the right move, if people in town would support it, if people in their organization would. And um, after seeing this, they, they decided that this might be a good way to put their toe in the water. And so um, I found that as, a, as an interesting um, benefit. So I said earlier that, that there are differences between old growth forests and these second growth forests that we have. And, and I want to talk a little bit about what some of those differences are. I'm going to talk about old growth structure, and I think structure is another word for component or element. What are some of those components in our forests or the elements of our forests that are different? Uh, and I think there are four major ones. 
first old growth forests have a greater diversity of tree sizes and ages. If you remember back to that graph, um, much of the farm fields were abandoned at the same time. And in terms of a land use history, that, that then resulted in forest growth that is predominantly of similar size, age, and structure. And so what we find in old growth forests is that, is that there's a greater diversity, big and little trees, uh, young and old trees, and the ranges are, are greater as well. So that um, you know, a large tree, when we say very large, you know, what we're talking about are, are 25 to 30 inch diameter trees. When we talk about very old trees, we're talking about two to 300 year old trees. Those are some differences. Snags, there's a lot more snags in old growth and the snags are larger, uh, as you might imagine, as some of these large 25 to 30 inch trees get old and die, um, they create large snags and they're much in much greater abundance than our second growth. The same goes for large down logs, as those, of course, as those snags then fall over, they create um, greater amounts of, of not only downed logs uh, on the forest floor, but large downed logs. And we see more gaps in the forest canopy, um, which relates back to the first bullet, which then creates uh, a greater diversity of tree sizes and ages and so forth. So I've been rambling through several slides, and, and it's a bit deceiving to be here staring at my screen. If I was uh, looking at you face to face, I might see some puzzled looks. So I just wanted to stop and, and take a breather and see if anybody has any questions at this point. So uh, in case you, um, Brian Hawthorne um, just typed in a question. You can see it in the chat pod to your left. Um, should that be large and or old trees? Uh, that's right. And some of those uh, ridge top of those really poor sites, you know, you might have trees that are, uh, you know, uh, 200 years old and, and, and inches in diameter. Um, so, so you can very well, depending on the site, have very old trees that are very large. That's uh, Greg e uh, emails a question in uh, regarding the OSHA standards, and, and that indeed is, is an issue. And um, I don't know if we have any licensed or, or harvesters on our list, but um, um, that is my understanding as well, is that there are requirements about being away from, um, for some reason, uh, one or two tree lengths away from those snags. This thing seems to ring a bell um, in terms of the OSHA requirements. So. Right, this indeed may have some, some safety issues for those operators uh, out there um, doing this type of work. And um, I guess I would have to default and check in with OSHA to see, see what exactly those requirements are. Certainly it might uh, speak towards equipment. There might be opportunities for um, more management from a feller buncher or something where there's a better safety from a, an operator being actually in a cab as opposed to a hand felling operation. But those are excellent points. Okay, I'm going to move forward. Please feel free. I can see out of the corner of my eye if people do type in. So, so feel free to do that. So we talked a little bit about the structure of those elements of, of an old growth forest. And I just wanted to go into a little more detail about that. Ah, Keith Carroll from Falconer DEC, good old New York. Um, that they have very large trees that are not old that people think are old growth. And that's an excellent point, Keith, that I'm going to pick up on near the end as we talk about where might you cite some of this old growth restoration treatment. I'm just going to hang on that for a minute. So in terms of the amount of dead wood on the forest floor, uh, some of Tony's research taking a look at the old growth in Massachusetts found that um, the old growth forest had two to four times more dead wood. Um, and if you were to put this into to units, cords, old growth had about 15 cords per acre. And the second growth forest, what we typically have, has something around 3.7 cords per acre. So a, a tremendous difference in the amount of cordwood. And as you can see some from, uh, from some of the pictures that I've included in here, you know, this cordwood is in various stages of decay. This one looks, looks um, relatively new. This one's, you know, decaying to a greater extent. Know, this is getting pretty mushy and at this point you know it's it's breaking apart and so forth um, 
Another thing that we'll talk about as we talk more about the active management is making sure that um, we don't have just one initial pulse of this coarse woody debris, that um, there's a plan over time to periodically add this type of wood to the forest floor. Because otherwise what you do is you end up with you know, an initial pulse of, of great stuff, but once it gets to this point, if you haven't made um, uh, the right plans or, or, or the right um, yeah the right plan, then you know you kind of lose. There's a there's a gap in, in the addition of this type of material. Um, let's see. Couldn't snags be secured before operating in an area? Uh, secured in a way uh, in terms of guidelines and that sort of thing. I guess I've never never heard of that. If if that's exactly what you meant. And Mark Curtis asks or comments that since cutting practice can be resolved in unbroken canopy in places, openings in places, and these yeah, over at Empire. Um, right. Oh, <laughs> they're piling up faster than I can react to. Um, so as far as I guess this is Marco's. Um, so structure, if you can think of it as, is, is I guess the uh, not only the elements but the, the the vertical and horizontal distribution of vegetations and plants and so forth. Um, if you think of it as the structure, as that as a difference, as you as you move from the forest floor up to the treetops, or you move across the site, you know, uh, parallel to the ground, you know, that provides a structural difference. And we'll elaborate more on, on the importance of that as we move forward. Peter Greeno uh, comments that um, should there be safeguards on the new biomass wave to ensure appropriate levels of residual debris on the floor? That too is an excellent point. It seems as though, you know, um, between <laughs> between what's happening, oil prices and, and oil levels and our advances in, in uh, technology and, and uh, obtaining good sustainable uh, sources of fuel, there there could very well be loggerhead, uh, no pun intended, regarding um, regarding the availability of biomass and, and and those types of management that um, try to recruit that into the system, and um, it's probably a great a great um, factor to be addressed individually, whether it be on public land or on private land uh, through a contract, um, determining how much is actually left, what diameters, and so forth. Um, it's not uncommon to have in a contract utilization standards, and that might be able to be addressed in that way. Um, you know, and each landowner will have to will have to uh, meld in their their objectives as to how much wood they want to be brought out. But that's a great point. Uh, Mark Evans comments maybe special sensitivity to more debris on forest floor on slopes, to aid in controlling erosion. Excellent. See, this is why I was wishing we were all in a room to share our collective wisdom. Those are those are great points. There's also more standing deadwood as well. Um, old growth forests in Massachusetts have two to three times more uh, functional snags. So um, again, this is something very different than the than the secondary forest we have now. Old growth for uh, trees themselves actually show their age differently. We're, we're so most of our trees are of a similar age in much of our forests that. Um, uh, we we tend to think of all of the as we identify tree species how having a similar look, but as the trees get older, um, you know they take on different looks. I was out on one of Tony's sites and I was particularly struck. Grab this. I was particularly struck by this picture on the left, this crown architecture. Um, I couldn't help but to think it looked like uh, one of the bonsai trees. Um, and this is this is a function of a tree being out. In the weather for you know close to 200 years or a little more, and um, being subject to ice and wind and so forth, and as the top breaks off and lateral branches move over, and it really makes an impact, and it really does have a different type of crown architecture than uh, most of the trees in the forest we see today. Another thing I want to draw your attention to on the right side of the screen is that this is a, a an approximately 300-year-old red oak, and uh, the bark is different on this than you might expect from a red oak you might run out and see in your own woodlot out in the back. Um, as bark develops, you know, it takes on a, a different look. This is called a tertiary bark. 
Um, so as trees get older, they take on, you know, a different bark as the tree matures. And, um, and that provides different opportunities for, for, um, for wildlife. So what are some of these wildlife habitat implications? Well, we talked a little bit about the diversity of tree diameters uh, providing forage habitat and cover for a wide range of species. So as you have a greater diversity of trees, big and small, um, that provides you know, different kinds of habitat uh, across that forest. Likewise, in, in bullet two, a diversity of tree heights creates multiple canopy layers. And all of that just gives greater variability of environmental conditions, um, which provides different niches for different species of wildlife habitat. That unique crown architecture that we saw in that sugar maple in the slide back, and that different bark morphology also can provide different types of environmental conditions. Um, that, that crown architecture can provide different types of perching um, and that bark can provide different types of foraging opportunities for birds that might be moving along the bowl and searching out insects, and, uh, and for lichens. And we talked about the lobaria uh, in an earlier slide, and uh, that too you know, can benefit as, as those things change in our forests. Large volumes of wood on the forest floor provide moist conditions and those seed beds or nurse logs, um, and also some some habitat opportunities for salamanders that need, um, and other amphibians that need moist environments. And the high density of large snags also provides opportunities for both um, bird species and mam small mammals, etc. So, so if you're interested in, in old growth, uh, having developing more old growth characteristics in your woods, you know, there are really two, two approaches that you can consider. One is passive management, and for many people and many organizations, this is something that, that um, they feel is the, the best way to, to go about this. And it's really just an, a non-intervention uh, type of method. It just let nature take its course. Uh, old growth structure will develop over time as trees just naturally grow and get larger, as natural disturbances such as windstorms, ice, and snow um, you know, come in and create those gaps um, whether it be a single tree dying and creating a gap for some seedlings, or whether it be a small group of trees dying um, and creating those gaps uh, and that coarse woody debris on the floor, you know, really what you're doing is just letting nature take its course, let things grow larger to get those large trees, let those natural disturbances such as wind and ice really get in there and work the stand and create the old growth structure. This will provide, you know, the most natural appearance in your woods. Um, you know, there's no cut stumps, uh, there's no skid trails uh, to look at, and so if that is an important consideration for you, then maybe passive management is right for you. I want to stress that passive management does not mean do nothing. Uh, we're going to talk uh, in later slides of the importance of of planning out and uh, designating both in the field uh, and also at, at home or at the office that your your intention is to let these these forests develop into old growth uh, or not old growth not true old growth but develop more old growth characteristics so it it's not just hey my plan here is to is to let this grow and walk away if you really are serious about that, there needs to be some intentional long-term forest planning, and there has to be some intentional long-term, if you're especially if you're a private landowner, some long-term estate planning or land protection options. Um, what we're talking about is a matter of decades, and if your forest isn't there in decades, it will never have the opportunity to develop in that late, that old growth structure. Wanted to put this slide in here just to reinforce that role of natural disturbance. I, I worked um, a lot with private landowners, as many of you have, and, and many of you are. And um, this is also a call I get quite often: is when trees die in the woods, what do I do? These pictures are from, um, well, I guess this was a blowdown maybe a year and a half ago out in Western Massachusetts. And um, you know, admittedly, this is pretty messy stuff. It looks pretty ugly. But the reality is, this is the exact kind of natural disturbance that helps create that old growth structure. 
grab my. You know, this is this is you know creating gaps that will create a new initiate a new uh, stand of trees, young seedlings. You can see some trees broken off here that will turn into snags that will eventually fall over and be that uh, those those that large woody debris on the floor. Um, and so while this looks messy, this indeed is the structure that it takes, uh, or this, these disturbances are what it takes to create that uh, old growth structure that that we're looking for. So it it at times you know um, can be very ugly, and that's just something you need to know up front. If you were a landowner, you know the best thing you could do here is to um, you know let this go. If your objective is to restore more old growth structure to your to your forests, and that can be very difficult for some people, and you have to kind of weigh that with your other objectives. Um, I don't know where most people are from, but in New England, southern New England, um, you know fire is a minimal, minimal concern. That's often something I hear quite a bit from folks. Um, I need to get in there and salvage. They saw. Uh, video of wildfires in California, and if you are in some of those fire-driven systems, you know that that indeed can be a concern. Um, we're fortunate out here that it's it's less of a concern. Um, oh my, I've let questions pile up. Okay, here. Uh, Mark Evans, physical structural complexity may aid in the trophic level complexity. More predators including That's right. That's right. A great comment. So uh, we talked a little bit about um, the timelines when I was talking about passive management. If you take a look at this slide, the age of most of our forests are somewhere around 70 to 100 years old um, based on when many of those farms were abandoned and, and about pine for box boards and so forth. And the stands um, uh, grew back. You know, we have some very similar aged stands in, in, in the Northeast. These old growth traits that we're talking about are really just starting to develop. You start seeing them um, in, in years 100 to, to about 200. And so if you were to take a passive approach to this type of management, um, you know, really what you're looking at is, is about a 100-year time frame before you're really at, at the point where you have enough, the structure in your forest is at a critical mass. And, and if that's a time frame that's OK with you, then, then passive management um, might be a good opportunity. What we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation, however, is the active management opportunities to speed this uh, timeline up so we can, in essence, mimic natural disturbance or learn from it and try to speed up this timeline to create uh, and recruit some of the old growth characteristics and structure. Uh, in, in a faster way. Before we do that, though, um, I was hoping just to get a sense of what, how often people that are on this um, seminar uh, website webcast um, do in terms of their active management. So if we could take 30 seconds and just if people could click in landowners, sorry, this is to landowners, um, can just kind of click in here how active or, or non-active, uh, what programs, what kinds of things that they are interested in or do on their land. That would be very helpful. I guess this is the best surrogate uh, for the raise your hand question at a workshop. Anybody else? A couple, couple. 41 out of 69, that sounds. That's right, and you can select all that apply. And for many of you, there might be multiple multiple squares that you're in that you would be checking all right sounds good looks like uh, landowners at least on here are working with a forester over half um, management plans and, and firewood are all high and uh, so is timber 
that's interesting. That's good. That's good. That'll be good for me to know as we move forward with the slides. So I'm going to close the poll. Oh, magic. Thanks, Pete. And move on. So the active management approaches for restoring old growth structure. Many of the, the tools that one might use for growing timber and doing more conventional silviculture are excellent tools for restoring old growth structure. And what I'm going to do is talk individually about um, the structure we've discussed earlier and some of the tools you can use um, relying heavily on traditional silviculture to, to, to restore those to a greater degree. By the way, this table one that you're seeing is from the publication that Pete put up on the Forest Connect website. So you can also refer to that. So if your interest is diversifying tree sizes and ages, uh, we recommend doing harvest single trees or small groups up to a quarter an acre. And for those of you, um, either foresters or landowners that have had active management on their land, um, sounds an awful like a lot like a single tree or a group selection system. Um, and what really we're looking at is trying to diversify the sizes of those trees and the ages of those trees by regenerating some new areas. Why a single tree or a quarter an acre, you might ask? Um, much of what we were looking at was actually northern hardwood. And as you take a look at the types of disturbances that we've seen historically in our forests over time, um, really what we see are, are disturbances on the order of a single tree or a small group of trees, you know, like a quarter of an acre. So really what we're doing is trying to mimic what we would have seen um, historically. Um, large scale, say, you know, entire stands or, or, or parts of your forest, if you will, replacing disturbances are, are more on the order of centuries, you know, 500 to 1,000 years maybe. We get something that big that would uh, replace that whole stand. And so um, really it's more driven by ice storm, wind storm, that sort of thing, knocking down a tree at a time or small groups of trees. In the photo below, you can see, uh, unfortunately, it's not the same site. I need to get out to that top site to get, a, to get a picture of that. But you can see what happens to that site, that gap, as we call it. Um, as the sun hits the floor, you start, um, geez, um, start regenerating in, and you start diversifying that structure. You can repeat that over and over, to, uh, depending on what your cutting cycle is. Uh, to create a multi-age multi forest, which would be uh, comparable to what we see in, in the old growth. And likewise, in a uh, selection system, it's not only regenerating, but there's also a component of uh, thinning attached to the selection treatment. And likewise, you can, while you're in, in the operation, go out and thin between trees, which will increase the growth rates on the residual trees. So you're, you're both regenerating and thinning to increase the size which helps you recruit that structure that, that will be closer to, to that old growth. If you wanted to increase the number of snags, well, you can actually go in and, and girdle the tree, uh, concentrating on medium to large if you want to mimic the types of snags that you characteristically find in, in some of those old growth systems. Um, a gir girdling the tree. Um, so there's a picture of it on the right. And really what you're doing, if, for those of you not familiar with it, would be to um, cut, you know, with an axe or a hatchet, um, the bark getting into the cambium uh, of the tree. Or, you know, I think most commonly people take a chainsaw and just do, you know, two or even three rings around the tree. What that does is it disrupts the flow of nutrients in water, and the tree eventually dies most of the time. Um, and so what you're doing is creating standing dead trees. And um, um, I see that there's an OSHA comment as well, and, and I ab absolutely, and those are things that you know you would have to balance both as a landowner in terms of your objective um, and the hazards to not only a timber harvester but also potentially hazards to a family family that likes to snowmobile or, or hike back there. You know, those are things that you're going to have to balance um, and and make it make an informed decision on. Um, However, if you want to increase the number of, of snags, you know, this is a technique to do that. You can also concentrate 
um, the girdling on trees of poor quality. Uh, and that might be a way to combine both old growth restoration and some timber management objectives. If your snags are the poor quality, you know, um, cabbage pine or, or big sugar maple that was left for the pasture, and uh, it makes a fantastic uh, snag, and when it falls over, it'll make a fantastic large down log, and maybe it released, you know, some some other nice pine or, or hardwoods. And so there is an opportunity here to do some amount of um, cultural treatment for timber as well as integrating that into the restoration of those old growth. Increasing down logs, um, again, you know, you can fell and leave uh, on the ground those some of those medium and large trees. Um, it's important to concentrate on those medium and large trees for a couple of reasons. One, it most closely mimics what you would find in an old growth system. And two, they'll serve the purpose longer. They'll take longer to decompose. And um, and, uh, and that is a good thing. Um, so you can concentrate on those medium and large trees. Uh, and again, by felling these trees, you know it's not not an unusual technique um, in pre-commercial operations um, where it doesn't pay necessarily to to extract timber. You know this is a way maybe to um, increase growth rates on neighboring trees as well as recruiting more of those down logs into the system. Um, I am going to, just as a note, I am going to stay uh, online and connected as, as, long as, as, um, as long as people want to. But because of the time, I, I, I definitely need to, to get going. Uh, so I'm going to hold off on questions, and I, I apologize for that. Legacy trees for the future structure. Um, this is, you know, if you're going to do one thing in your forest, this could be the single most important action to create old growth structure. Uh, a legacy tree is something that is left in the woods to um, to to eventually turn into that cavity when it dies, and then when it falls down on the ground, it turns into the log. And so, maintaining some of these legacy trees in your forest, if you're going to do one thing, you know this would be this would be the thing to do. And how many you decide to leave. Um, will be up to your objectives. And we're going to talk a little bit about how many in the slide or two. Groups of these legacy trees are referred to as patch reserves. So there might be a small area or, or as large of an area as you would like, um, an area of trees um, that are, are left alone, um, considered your patch reserve, or a group of legacy trees uh, in an area that you're going to dedicate. And maybe it's the whole property. Maybe it's one part of the property. Maybe it's separate parts of the property that's up to you and a, and a, and a forester um, but you know um, creating some of these patch reserves that will eventually turn into those cavities uh, and those down logs is, is really critical um, it's you know as we talk about some of this old growth structure you might be sitting there saying well gee you know I have microbursts in my woods and, and I have you know large cavity trees in my woods and I have large down logs and and that's that's all true and that's great and, and in fact I think what we want to do is um, identify some of that old growth structure in your current woods and try to enhance that by placing you know legacy trees or patch reserves around these existing old growth structures. If you've already got some of it, um, let's go in and try to enhance that by uh, designating some of those trees as legacy trees. Uh, again, I've got to I've got to reinforce this idea of planning. Um, we're talking, as we saw in the timeline, we're talking about decades, 100 years maybe for passive and, and certainly decades even if you decide to go and do active management. So we're talking about long timelines. Um, if you're a landowner, uh, the average age of a landowner is about 60 years old. You know, this land is going to pass hands um, from one generation to another, from one owner to another, and designating both in the field um, you know what you're trying to do out there, whether it be big fat red L's out on the trees, noting them as legacy trees, mapping them, and passing that on to your your son or daughter that's inheriting the property, uh, putting it incorporating into a management plan. You know those are all things that we'll need to you know that to ensure that the decades will have will go by and you'll have forest cover and the legacy trees you left will still be there uh, is really critical. Uh, increasing the number of large living trees, and we've touched on this a little bit, um, just by actually thinning the woods, you can increase the, the size of the trees around them. 
and get up to some of those larger diameters um, that you might typically find in an old growth system. I find pictures can be somewhat confusing. You know, there's a lot of green. There's just kind of a green wall, and, and, and I know what I'm looking at, but, but it can be difficult to um, um, sometimes communicate to other people. So we have these diagrams drawn up. If this is, you know, kind of a typical second growth system that you might find, um, you know, prevalent all over the Northeast, and if you were to incorporate down here some of the techniques we've talked about, this is, you know, some of what it might look like. This isn't exactly the scale, but, you know, if you create that quarter acre gap, and if you girdle the tree near it, fell the tree, girdle the tree to create future cavities, fell the tree to create down coarse woody debris, and thin in between some of these trees with nice canopies, so they'll grow nice, big, and strong and fast, then, you know, this is kind of a combination of those treatments. You'll notice from some of the stumps, we've tried to suggest that in this particular case, people took out some of the logs, but left some of the logs in there as well. If you were to follow that in about 15 years, um, that tree that was girdled is now a snag. It's been killed. We've had it, um, the stand, that quarter acre gap is, has initiated a, a new stand, or excuse me, a new group, a gap of young trees. That down log is starting to rot, and we're seeing that the, the trees that we thinned are growing bigger. Likewise, if we look 30 years after, those small trees are growing larger. The tree, this is an important point, that we left has decayed, and now the standing snag is now lying down. So, you know, essentially what we're looking for is a, is a conveyor belt, a constant infusion of snags and uh, down logs. And so preparing for that and managing for that is something that, that will be important. Um, the, the trees have been um, thinned, and so they're growing nice and large, cranking away there. And, of course, we've got our L's on there for trees marked as legacy trees. Hopefully that just gives you a simplified version of, of that, uh, what we're talking about. This, too, comes from the publication, uh, Restoring Old Growth Characteristics. And we just wanted to come up. We, I think it's important to recognize that there isn't one particular way to do this. It's really a combination of ways um, that can be incorporated depending on the landowner's objective. Uh, and, and so I, I just I very much want to stress that, that there isn't a cookie-cutter prescriptive approach to that. And we've tried to communicate that in here. And, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the amount of legacy trees as well. Um, so as you're moving, so, so here's passive management, and obviously not a lot of timber revenue if you're not cutting trees. And if you're really interested in, in this active management idea, um, you know, what we can find in the literature is the percentage goal of about 25 to 50 percent of the dominant and co-dominant or the main canopy trees identified as legacy trees. And in this particular case, you know, this is an active approach, but this is a, a non-extractive active approach. This might be somebody walking in with a chainsaw and thinning trees and girdling trees and felling trees to the ground and not ever having a skitter, um, you know, on the site. And, you know, certainly this would be, you know, a cost to the landowner, but, um, and, and, and for either a public entity or a conservation organization, or even a private landowner, that may be worth it to them, uh, to you. You may have the money or means to do that. The other thing that, that I've encouraged some of our in-state fish and wildlife folks to think about um, is there's currently cost sharing for early successional habitat. And I think it would be very interesting to, to work on a kind of a pilot project to see if there's an opportunity to, to pay somebody to go in and, uh, and do some of this work. So. Um, that would be an active, non-extractive. And then these last three are, are active and extractive. And again, if it's a primary goal for you, you know, 25 to 50% as, uh, of the main canopy is legacy trees and, and so forth. If it's of medium, you know, 10 to 25%. And if it's something you want to do, but it's certainly not your prime objective, you know, even just leaving a few cavity trees uh, per acre and, um, and going about uh, civil culture, um, as your forester recommends, is, uh, you know, have a big impact as well. So where we talked about this idea of patch reserves, and um, so where might you place those patch reserves? We talked a little bit in that about that first bullet, 
you know, finding existing old growth structure in your woods, you know, where do you have snags and downed logs or, or gaps that have been created through natural disturbance? Um, uh, where do you have some large trees? These would all be, you know, good indicators of, of where you might want to site some of this type of work. There was a comment in the chat pod a little bit a few minutes ago regarding productive sites or, or large and small trees and so forth. And, um, you know, large, uh, excuse me, productive sites are an excellent place to site this type of this type of treatment or this type of management because it will grow the trees faster and you'll see the characteristics develop faster. And a good example, this is a, a site in... Um, Western Massachusetts that um, most folks consider old growth, um, and it's really not. It's it's just an excellent site. This is a white pine tree that's about 85 years old, and that's me standing next to it. And you know, it's a it's a big tree. And as someone commented earlier, people walk in and have this expectation that they're poison or something, uh, and that's the sign of old growth. And in reality, you know, this is just a function of a great site. It's a great, very productive site and so it's growing you know big trees fast those make excellent places to site your um, old growth restoration uh, treatments um, so before I move on lest I be kicked out of SAF or, or another forestry organization um, you know I would also note uh, to landowners and of all types you know that these productive sites are also the best place to grow timber you know because it grows best trees the fastest so, you know, it really is, you know, trying to get a sense of, of what your objectives are and how much uh, you want to lean one way or the other. I think it's important to consider environmental variation. If we all went out there and we all did this type of, of work on, on um, you know, dry um, northern hardwood sites, then what we would find is a very similar structure across the landscape because we've only done it in, you know, a, a very specific environmental condition. Um, Consider doing it on wet sites, dry sites, uh, sites of different forest types. You know, I think that will help develop structure um, that is, you know, comparable. Uh, because obviously, when um, 70 to 90 percent of our of our cover in Massachusetts was old growth, certainly there was great amounts of environmental variation within there. So you can be selective about that and be very intentional and say, hey, we've got one wet, let's do a dry, or we've got a uh, central hardwood, let's do a northern hardwood, um, or, you know, especially if you're a larger landowner, you can um, designate a large area and, and assume that there's environmental variation within an important point. And then, again, placing those legacy trees and those patch reserves around those features that you've identified. Can't, can't stress this enough, and I have already probably, but um, long-term planning. You know, I mentioned early successional habitat a uh, slide or two back, and you know, it's a, it's a management that you can see almost immediate results from, um, certainly relative to um, old growth restoration. But, you know, working with a forester um, to incorporate it, if you have a management plan, if you don't or you don't want a management plan, you know, um, documenting it somehow, whether it be just in a document and a map, um, documenting it on the ground, painting, scribing, whatever you may be able to do, um, and then making sure that that's noted in future forest planning uh, is important. Uh, if you're doing active management, you, you want to make sure skitters aren't going through those areas if they don't have to, or those legacy trees aren't being cut down if you're not doing an entire area. And certainly estate planning, such as conservation easements or restrictions, you know, to ensure that the forest cover, you know, has time, has those decades to develop into that old growth structure. So, in Massachusetts, we've gone through a process. Uh, the state agencies and some of the conservation organizations have gone through a process to identify some areas um, of, of large forest blocks and, um, and to try to concentrate uh, some, some passive management uh, in these areas. And I just want to note that in the, in the east and, and, in, and in the northeast in particular, you know, these, these public lands or, or really any large landholder can play a very unique role in landscapes dominated by small forest landowners. You know, these are big patches of woods that, um, that are unique and can play a critical role in providing, you know, interior forest habitat and recruiting old growth, old growth structure. So these are some of the areas in Massachusetts 
that were identified by Fish and Wildlife and the Massachusetts chapter of TNC um, as, as real likely candidates, and the state has gone ahead and designated those reserves. But the reality is this, you know, if, if, if restoring old growth is going to be successful across you know, any part of the northeast or the east, it's going to mean, you know, working with private landowners, you know, half of whom uh, of our folks today are, and I'm thrilled you're here. Um, and really, even the integrity of some of these large forest reserves that, that a public landowner might do um, rely on having, you know, a matrix, an ocean of, of, of forest around them and, and can enhance their value by um, complementary management. So I really want to stress in, in these landscapes, you know, it, once again, it's up to private landowners who want to see this succeed in, in this. So landscape scale management. This is a, a great slide here. Um, the idea that you know all these private, all, all of you, all of your private landowners, um, you know, are really like puzzle pieces in a landscape. You know, this, this, the the picture below looks like you know just a sea of forest, but the reality is there are multiple ownerships. Um, you know, tens or hundreds of ownerships within that landscape. And each of those landowners fit together like a puzzle. So this is one of the forest blocks that was identified in Massachusetts. The very dark green is mostly state land, uh, wildlife management area, and state forest in combination. This other lighter green are, you know, this is the forest block. And then this lightest green here is, is the area around them that would be helpful to protect and have complementary management on in an ideal world. And you know, you might say, hey, not doing too bad here. You've got, I don't know, a third to half of some of these areas permanently protected by a public organization. And then, you know, I want to show you this. This is what happens when you overlay the parcel lay layer onto that. I like it so much I want to do it again in slow-mo. It's just amazing. It is it, it's astounding to me. So when we're talking about whether it be old growth restoration, whether it be really successional habitat, hiking trails, whatever it is, you know, uh, this is a great example of why it's important to look across your stone walls and your boundaries and see what's going on around you. It doesn't have to be communism, you know, it can it can be good communication between neighbors. You know, you don't have to move lockstep, but knowing what each other are doing um, can help both of you attain your goals to a greater extent. That's private and private and private and public. This is um, some work we're doing, Tony and I, um, uh, with a landowner, a private landowner, who's got a conservation easement on, on his land. Um, we're doing some research, putting in some of these quarter acre gaps. Um, it's being funded by the Mass Chapter of Nature Conservancy. And as you can see, it's, a, it's an ideal position um, as, this, as this management would complement some existing management uh, on, on fish and wildlife land where they've um, done some civil cultural operations and maintained legacy trees in there. This is something I'm still playing with. Tony and I are hoping to come out with something. Um, the land managers that I've uh, spoken with and gone out in the field with, um, seems like it would be helpful to have something uh, akin to a marking guide, You know, just kind of a step-by-step. -step. How, how might you go through it? It's certainly not the end-all be-all, but it just might be you know, um, some steps to consider if you're interested in this type of thing. I think one of the first things to do is decide on the percentage of canopy that you're going to leave, and, and that's a conversation with uh, with your private landowner uh, or within your own organization. You know, are, are you in that 25 to 50 percent range, or are you in that you know a couple trees per acre range, and and make a decision as to how much of a priority this is. Choose the restoration areas. Remember, those more productive sites will get you there quicker, but they also might bump into some of your other objectives. Identify existing old growth structure in those restoration areas. Um, and 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 then cite those patch reserves and your work around those existing old growth uh, structures. With document it both in the field and at home, whether it be red L's on the tree or scribing or your management plan. You know, make sure um, it's communicated uh, clearly to you, your family, your organization, and those that come after you, and plan the future of your land. So uh, a couple steps on getting started. You know, again, how does old growth structure uh, and, and restoring it fit with your current landowner objectives? Uh, working with a forester, and I saw about half of the landowners on there ha are already working with a forester. Um, so I think that's great. Um, I think that's a great first step. I highly encourage it. 
contacting a land trust, you know, to find out your estate planning options, uh, again, I think is critical. Um, I, we have about, in Massachusetts, we have about 15% of our landowners that are uh, have a, a, a forest management plan, and, and if memory serves correct, that's actually pretty darn high relative to other states. And, um, and I think estate planning is even way lower than that. Uh, in fact, I can't find any good numbers on how many landowners have done some estate planning, but the reality is, you know, this type of management really does, the underpinning of it is making sure that the forest cover is going to be there. So a couple of summary thoughts. Uh, old growth forests are rare uh, and historically important forest type. They were the dominant land type uh, for thousands of years in, under which our species evolved. There are both passive and active management strategies that you can choose. Um, that the old growth restoration, if you choose active, can be implemented in a variety of intensities and combinations to fit your goals. It's not a cookie cutter. You know, it's a matter of getting in and playing with it and um, seeing what works for you and your land and your family. That even if you decide to do just a, a simple, I uh, shouldn't necessarily say simple, but one single old growth restoration treatment, it can make a big difference, you know, both to your own property as well as the landscape that it sits in. And if you were to do one, you know, I would ask you know, or suggest maybe considering the legacy tree as, as an excellent one to get started. Know how your land fits into the landscape. Look around. See what's going on on the other side of those stone walls. See where the opportunities may be to communicate or, or, or even work with a, a, a neighbor, public or private, to, um, to have a greater impact on that landscape. And again, to be sure that there's long-term forest and estate planning. So when Tony and I started uh, this this project, it couldn't help but have you know Saint Aldo uh, quote ringing in my ears, and we included in the publication as well. And just want to end with it um, to keep every cog and wheel as the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And we know that there are some things that that you know restoring old growth you know whether uh, is important you know whether it be um, species that depend on it like Loberia or making our our um, stands um, more resilient to change over time, um, that's important. You know, but there's also, I think, um, something um, intuitively right about also making sure that we're, we're keeping all of our cogs and wheels. I wanted to end with that. And then just acknowledge financial support for Tony's research on old growth was made possible by, gee, I sound like a PBS, Harvard Forest and the University of Mass at Amherst. And uh, the publication that we that uh, we were able to put out and our current research efforts are being supported by the Mass Chapter of TNC, as well as UMass. And uh, Pete, I'm very sorry uh, I went over. I got rambling, I guess. And I'm happy to stay on uh, if folks are interested and in, in answer some of the questions that have like uh, piled Paul, up. that was a great great job. Don't. Um... No need to apologize. This uh, it was a lot of fun, and it was clear from the interaction that there's a lot of folks that are really interested in this. I'm going to uh, a couple of things we'll do. Um, one person or a couple of folks said, "Where's the publication that's a, that's associated with this that you had mentioned?" That publication is on the Forest Connect website where you went to register for this, um, and where you if you go look at the schedule or. Uh, we're going to use the web links connection. I'm going to send everybody who's here. Uh, their web browser is going to open up to Paul's website, which is masswoods.net. Uh, actually, I won't do that right now, but I'll just put it up there. So masswoods.net. If you go there, Paul's publication on old growth with uh, Tony D'Amato is on that site, and you can pick it up there. Before, um, while you're in the process of formulating your questions, uh, we need to have you do one last poll, if you will. This helps us get a sense for what you've uh, gained from this. If you could just take a few minutes, please. There are 64 of you to, to click in here. You should be able to click on multiple answers. And while you're doing that, I'll let Paul scroll back and forth in that chat in the chat pod and take a look at some of the questions that people are asking. So, and then Paul can respond to those. And as I understand, Paul's going to be available here for several minutes if other people have questions. So I see that Brian has questions, and John had a question, Jamie had a question. So, uh, Paul, I'll let you respond to those, and uh, we're getting people to vote. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess I also wanted to uh, comment that um, 
on this last side, uh, when the poll uh, gets minimized, the my contact information, uh, phone number, and email address, as well as Tony D'Amato's, is there. And we are both happy to talk offline or, or send us an email or give us a call. We'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Um, in the back of the publication, I mentioned a couple of other resources that folks might be interested in. Um, you know, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Bill Keaton up in Vermont that's done some work along these lines. Um, let's see, the Manomet Center as well, done some work on, on this, some excellent work. And uh, there's also a publication um, from the Nature Conservancy, Natural Dynamic Silviculture by Roe and Rusnick, um, which also is, is an excellent one and um, might be something worth checking out. So I would just um, say that before folks start signing off. And um, so I guess no, I'm, I, just gonna, yeah, I'm just going to say that place I looks like the voting has slowed down. So I'm going to close this and turn the floor back over to you, Paul, so you can uh, go through the questions that are here. So uh, let's see. You, uh, the, Mark the first one, I think, goes back to Jamie Savage. You're green Go ahead, Paul. All right. I'm just a scrolling. Okay, I was scrolling. I didn't know if my scrolling showed up on your screen or not. Um. So uh, Carlin Emanuel is a, a forester. The old growth coarse food debris is, in, is large in size. Logging creates coarse food debris that's small. Yes, that's right. And so, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do, I heard the term morticulture at one point. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is grow, you know, big dead logs, <laughs> both standing and on the ground. And, and because of the size of our current systems, our current uh, forests, you know, what you end up with oftentimes, uh, even though there are some large trees, you do end up with a lot of smaller trees, especially after a, a silvicultural operation. You know, a uh, forester may have been in there doing some thinnings, and, and maybe it's the smaller uh, suppressed trees. So you do end up with smaller things, um, and and it is better to have the bigger the bigger dead wood. It does last a lot longer, and it is much closer to, to what uh, you would find in old-growth forests. And that's why we're trying to grow big dead things. Um, Pete, are you scrolling on me, my friend? I'm not. So, and when you scroll, nobody sees it. So you'll need oh, okay. to uh, read the question. All right. All right. Uh, Peter Greeno comments that this is uh, an OSHA hurdle for licensed harvesters, and, and and you know I couldn't agree more. Um, it it it, it it's tough, dangerous work to begin with. There's no question about it, let alone throwing in a bunch of dead trees. And, and I don't quite know how to go about uh, about um, uh, commenting on it other than, you know, you have to be very safe. Uh, certainly the timber harvester has got to be uh, comfortable with it and all precautions have to be taken to make sure or to minimize the likelihood or the chance of something happening. Um, Brian Hawthorne. Comments that uh, recent research from Pennsylvania found that wind disturbance sizes were mostly up to three hectares, uh, larger than a quarter of an acre. I'm not familiar with that. That's new information. That's great. He cites Evans et al. 2007. Um, much of the work I, I was relying on is um, is based on you know Laura Moore and Wright, White's work. Um, and some other folks. Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Fravor, uh, who had a study in 2004 up in Maine, and uh, much of what they found, you know, places those most typical disturbances at a couple trees to a quarter acre or so. Um, really, what that does is it it, it means about a one percent change per year. And so, if you're a forester and you're thinking about, you know, gosh, my my entries, you know, with my client is is once every 10 years for a cutting cycle. You know what that would translate to is, is to something like 10% of the canopy treated every 10 years. Likewise, if you were to go to 20-year cutting cycle, it would be you know like 15 to 20% of the canopy. So you'd have to adjust from there. And of course, uh, it's the great um, art of silviculture. So so it's a combination of science and art, and there's no hard and fast rule. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark Holt asks. Um, 
how many snags per acre and trees per acre would you consider uh, would you consider old growth? Um, you know, I don't know an exact number per acre. Um, you can refer back to you know Tony's work that had I think it was two to four times more than what we have now. And certainly, you know, uh, you'll you'll probably see a a break point where um, you get a diminishing return um, in terms of habitat value. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that what that number is. More, how's that, Mark? More for a number. Um, Randy uh, Starmer comments that a big challenge I see in managing disturbed areas is that these are prime areas for invasive species, and that that's a good point. Um, you know, hopefully the value of, of these areas that are undisturbed uh, will be that they, they will have less invasive species and so forth. I think it's also another great comment on the importance of that landscape perspective. If uh, there's a landowner, let's say a public landowner, a state forest for instance, that makes the decision that interior forest habitat and, and recruiting old growth structure in a passive way is important, and then houses get developed all the way around it, um, there's opportunity as as people move in and plant landscaping or or ride their horse or mountain bike or or whatever it is to get into those areas and so so buffering these areas with that matrix I, I think uh, for something like invasive species is an excellent example of of why that's so important. Eric Jones asks, will globalization and resulting invasive species and invasive pathogens render our efforts to to uh, recreate old growth? Wow, that's not a small question, Eric. Um, you know, I, I guess we touched on a little bit on that that invasive comment, um, and, and uh, by um, the globalization, I'm assuming you mean importing pests, and and whether it be Asian longhorn or or hemlock woolly delgate or whatever it might be. You know, there's no doubt that um, things are coming down the pike, and at some point, you know, our worst fears are going to happen, and and that you know, emerald ash borers in New York, I think already, and and so these things are going to happen. I guess. You know, I guess intuitively it feels like if we have more structure uh, similar to how our forests evolved, I, I've got to, you know, I don't know if there's hard data on this, but you know, intuitively it feels like they would be more resilient to to these these types of pests and pathogens because they're operating and functioning in a way that they've evolved for thousands of years. Um, let's see. Uh, Brian Hawthorne is taking advantage of the internet as a tool and has posted some links on both the Pennsylvania research uh, as well as he's cut and paste some things on on OSHA so you can take a look at those when you have an opportunity. Um, Peter Greeno asked if we could post the name of the Nature Conservancy publication. Um, Pete, is that something you might be able to do or do you want me to type it into a pod? Is that what uh, Brian put at the bottom? nature.org slash oh, that's it. Excellent. Excellent. Yep, that's exactly right. That uh, dealt mostly with northern hardwoods and I think some spruce firs. Uh, it's more more of a northern New England, I believe, publication from memory, but, but you know, excellent. It, it goes over a lot of what we talked about today and I, I think it's an excellent publication and, and TNC has been doing some great work in this um, um, in many places, including Pennsylvania. Um, a guy named Dylan Jenkins down there is doing some fun stuff. Northern New Hampshire is devoid of local land trusts. Would it be practical to start a land trust? Eric, you're our guy. Go forth and conquer. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's very important. You know, this this intergenerational transfer is 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 a huge tsunami on the horizon, and how all these landowners react and, and how they pass on their land is, you know, going to in large part determine, you know, our forests in the future and the benefits they provide. Um, there are certainly some wonderful regional uh, land trust that I'm sure cover that area, whether it be NEF uh, or, or the Nature Conservancy, some of the large ones. Um, my experience with uh, working with landowners on, on land conservation is that, you know, um, they're different, and so there's a segment of them that is most comfortable dealing with their friends, and neighbors, and, and people from their own community that are, are in a local land trust. So in terms of uh, ensuring, um, you know, these forest state forests, uh, be an excellent move forward to initiate a local land trust, although no small feat, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to scroll back up and just make sure I haven't. If someone could type in, if you're still on, and, and I missed your comment, I I apologize. I'm. Uh, 
Um, I just want to, uh, Bruce uh, Patton, Peyton, excuse me, um, you mentioned the hemlock woolly delgate is causing greater than quarter acre gaps, but is creating many snags down material, um, you know, if there is any hemlock remaining in 200 plus years. Um, our historical record of insects and pathogens would not have included the hemlock woolly delgid. So it's, a, it's another, I guess, comment on, on uh, Eric Jones's comment about globalization. You know, some of these things are coming down the pike. We're not really sure what the heck our, our natural disturbance um, uh, scenarios will be in the future because these things are doing different things to our woods than we've experienced in the past. Um, if you do, uh, a, you know, a, a monitoring and a, I, I guess just a personal thought, um, just in terms of the hem, those hemlock sites, um, you know, a, a, I think a, I think a, <laughs> I'm gonna get myself into trouble. I'm sure. I, I think a do nothing approach is, is it's certainly a safe bet. Um, I think you know as they as they fall apart and and light hits the floor, um, you know you're gonna you're gonna get cavity trees developed. You're gonna get you know those large probably uh, logs on the on the forest floor, and you know these sites are gonna are certainly gonna regenerate themselves, and so that would be one thought if if you know timber production and so forth is not a huge uh, priority for you. Uh, so, uh, were there any other thoughts? Oh, um, uh, two people mentioned um, functional snag. Christy and uh, I just saw it. Mark Curtis um, mentioned functional snag snags that that are 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 functioning as habitat. Uh, just you know, no, no different than probably definition of snag that you're thinking. Um, ooh, some new questions. All right. Um, oh, excellent point. Um, Eric uh, said that I mentioned sugar maple, beech, and white pine, um, and he asked about oak, yellow birch uh, as legacy species. You know, what are the most beneficial? I think the, um, if you can uh, prioritize long-lived species, why I was mentioning the oak and, and the beech and the pine, um, you know, you're you're going to be uh, the sugar maple, the beech, and the pine. You're going to be in good shape. Uh, in terms of the oak and the yellow birch, uh, you know, I think those are good species. As I showed that slide earlier. There was a red oak in there that was um, that was over 300 years old. So I think depending on what part of the country you're in, you know, prioritize long-lived species that are going to get big, um, fatten up, die, and be great standing dead wood as well as logs. Uh, let's see. Uh, Armin mentions the Forest Legacy Program, which is uh, which provides donate uh, for donation as well as purchase of conservation restrictions. Recently completed the first donation of Pennsylvania. Outstanding. Um, yeah, it's a great program. The Forestry Legacy Program is a U.S. Forest Service program uh, whose intention is to uh, permanently protect working landscapes, forests in particular. And uh, it's another option. Uh, I, think, I think all states have a Forest Legacy Program. So you can contact your State Bureau of Forestry uh, or Forest Stewardship Program, and they can probably give you more information. You could also just Google Forest Legacy Program at the Forest Service, and I'm sure there's information there. But they, too, in addition to a, a land trust uh, or a private uh, conservation organization, can work with landowners on, on planning the future of their land. And, and um, I shouldn't have excluded our, our, um, our uh, friends that are public conservation organizations as, uh, as being excellent sources of, of the type of assistance as well. Are there any natural old growth areas in southeast Maine or demonstration restoration areas that we could visit? You know, um, none down in southeast Maine, Roy, although they're one of the reserves that uh, I, I mentioned in the public land slide that's, uh, that was uh, implemented is down at Miles Standish, uh, which you must be familiar with. And I'm sure that, um, you know, as you watch that over time, you know, that's, that's part of, part of the, uh, the plan. As far as demonstration areas, um, I believe the Harvard Forest is in the process of planning uh, some of these techniques that would be used as a model forest, and that's located in Peter's Hand. I don't think I think they've got foresters with boots on the ground, but but I don't think they have um, any uh, any 
anything implemented quite yet. And, and I actually recently walked with a fellow from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, out in, I believe, Holland, Mass., which is south central, that uh, was interested in this idea and was considering starting a model forest as well. So maybe there will be some things to come. Roy, if you own land and you want to do it, let me know. Um, in northern New England, John McKerney asked that there are uh, areas in northern New England. Um, there is some, uh, yes, in Maine, and I'm going to space out on the name, um, but some, some very good research comes from um, the folks up in, up in Maine who have been taking a look at, at their reserves and, um, and kind of these changes through time. How much canopy is uh, how much canopy is removed during a natural disturbance or, or dropped, um, and to be honest with you, I'm just I, I'm blanking on the name, but that in northern New England would be a, a good um, a good go. So I, I think if you probably Google um, something on reserves in, in Maine, it'll probably send you on the right path. Ah, and Mark Curtis mentions that in the northwestern Pennsylvania area, there's a natural old growth area, uh, and part of it was hit by a tornado in 85, so you'll be able to see that that nice, ugly legacy of disturbance that creates such beautiful structure. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to step in here. Um, Paul's done a great job. If there's maybe one or two more pressing questions or comments, then we can take those. Otherwise, I think we need to wrap this up. We're, we're pushing on the one uh, thirty hour, and um, I need to, in fairness to Paul as a speaker, we need to give him a chance to take a break, and, and some of you will also, I'm sure, have other uh, things you need to get on to. Paul will be back again live and in person at 7 p.m., and um, I want to thank all of you for this is a great turnout. Paul did a great presentation, and um, it's just it's a delight to have this opportunity to interact in this fashion. We have people just from their names I know from throughout the Northeast and New England and, and Central states. So um, this is this is great. Um, my appreciation to Paul as a speaker and to his colleague uh, Anthony D'Amato from University of Minnesota. If you want to see a recording of this, it'll be available hopefully this afternoon at uh, the Forest Connect website if you click on the Web Conferences button. So have a great afternoon, y'all, and with this we'll be signing off. Paul, if you want to stick around for just a minute, we can chat about uh, Indeed, and, and I just wanted evening. to thank so, everybody for taking thank, the time out. I'm, I'm sorry it went longer. Um, thank you for your patience and, and sticking sticking with it. It, it really is a, 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 an interesting subject. and uh, you know, I, I, I wish I knew more to answer your questions better, um, but in some ways, you know, we're kind of on the front end of this, and and uh, I would encourage you to seek out other great sources of people doing this type of thing. And Pete, thank you so much for inviting me. This is great technology, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to figure it out and set it up. It makes our, all of our lives easier. So. Well, this is great. So with this, we'll officially close this session, and uh, wish you all a great afternoon.